Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Collum, and welcome to this next edition of Human Landing Site Study Hangouts, or HLS2 Hangouts, a joint presentation by NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Science Mission Directorate here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Today's briefing on Exploration Zones Nocus Terra, Deuteronomus Mense, and Flegra Dorsa build on the conversations that started at the first human landing site workshop for human missions to the surface of Mars, which was held in October 2015 in Houston, Texas. Before I introduce today's presenters, let's get to know our HLS2 steering committee co-chairs, Ben Bussey and Rick Davis, who is joining us remotely. Ben is the chief exploration scientist in NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, and Rick is the assistant director for science and exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Ben, Rick, any words? After you, Rick. Uh, Rick, I think you're muted. Uh, yes, thank you for the help. <laughs> so uh, first of all, big thanks uh, uh, to everyone um, that helped prep these talks at the workshop that we did in uh, late 2015. We created uh, an ability to uh, ask for data requests from our assets at Mars. And this is the first time we've actually, uh, when we've been filling out these data requests, um, uh, that we've actually, are gonna see what we learned from those. And that's a big step. And we'll be contacting other exploration zone uh, proposers to share what they're learning too. And that's really key for helping us all advance everything that we're doing. So thank you uh, to the guys that are presenting and thank you to everyone online. Ben, over to you. No, also excited to see uh, what, what the new data has enabled and whatever, and also if any new you know science discoveries in the last three years maybe even have tweaked or made more interesting the exploration zones that were chosen. All right, thank you, Ben and Rick. And now let's introduce our presenters. Joining us from Brown University, we have Jim Head. Jim is a professor of geological sciences who will discuss lessons learned from the Deuteronomus Mense site. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? And joining us from Arizona State University, we have John Hill. John is a Themis mission operator who will discuss lessons learned from the Noca Nocus Terra site. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. And joining us from Maxed Inc. We have Don Barker. Don is the CEO of Max Inc. and will discuss lessons learned from the Flegra Dorsa site. Hi, Don. How's it going? Uh, feel free to ask any questions for our presenters in the live chat on our YouTube page, and we'll answer them during the stream. And with that, let's jump right in. Now, over to you, uh, Jim. Well, thanks very much. And uh, if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, it's great to be here. We had a great time at the workshop uh, talking about our initial uh, analyses of the Deuteronomus Mensi site. And uh, if you can see the first slide, we're good. So that would be um, indeed an uh, international team that we put together to take a look at the characteristics of these sites. And you'll see in the middle of the first slide um, the, um, the Deuteronomus site. This is, happens to be at a latitude of 39 degrees. Uh, which is the same latitude as NASA headquarters, so that must mean this is an excellent site. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, the uh, optional exploration, uh, optimal exploration zone, of course, the EZ. We were trying to think about, of course, uh, how, where, and how we could uh, uh, like to explore Mars with, with humans, of course. So the key was humans, and so that means you need to have a, a very interesting scientific site, but it also need, means you need to have resources. So. We actually um, wanted to maximize the potential science return uh, from the future human exploration mission zones. Um, and uh, let's see, are we getting the slides uh, broadcast over? Uh, we are. Okay, just checking. Um, and the second thing is that we needed to look for potential resources. These are really required to support humans. So that's what we really wanted to focus on today. Um, we're developing concepts uh, and engineering systems at the same time, and of course, uh, a key guideline from that workshop was to identify SKGs to guide future robotic exploration. So this is critically important. And then, of course, we wanted to talk about future exploration in a sense that what do we need in requirements for missions or uh, instruments on international or U.S. Uh, missions as well uh, to get to where we want to be uh, to have humans explore and stay on the surface of Mars. Next, please. 
So our uh, site was, in fact, to take a look at the characteristics of um, ice-related deposits, water being one of the key items that uh, are needed, obviously, for humans in the long term. It's very hard to, uh, in fact, carry huge amounts of water to Mars, and we know that's a resource there. So we're focusing on this indeed. And it's well known that most of the water, as you can see in the lower left-hand part of the slide, uh, is at the polar caps at the present time. And indeed, uh, the uh, point is that uh, during pre previous times in the history of Mars, changes in the spin axis, orbital parameters, particularly obliquity, uh, means that that polar ice has been transported to lower latitudes and is left there uh, covered usually with a sublimation lag. So we already have the water delivered to mid-latitudes, and so one of our key points here is to find the most sweet spot, if you will. Next slide, please, which will indeed give us um, the kinds of resources we need. So indeed, we found that those were the mid-latitude um, low bait debris aprons and lineated valley fill. And you can see the two bands that are darkened a little bit at the mid-latitudes show, uh, in fact, examples of um, lineated valley fill and low bait debris aprons. So we've really been focusing on these as the resource potential. Shown in the next slide is, in fact, a uh, the characteristics of uh, a perspective view on lineated valley fill, uh, debris-covered valley glacier systems on the mid-latitudes of Mars. And on the right, indeed, is a glacial system on the Earth. And you can see the similarities there as the ice is streaming off the plateau down into through these alcoves, joining up to produce these lineated valley fills. So we know we're really confident uh, that, in fact, from a morphological and a perspective point of view from terrestrial analogs, that we're looking at buried glacial ice. And we'll come back to absolute proof of that in a second. Next, please. We've also looked at the characteristics of, um, uh, in fact, the uh, climate modeling. We've modeled these in terms of general circulation models and shown, in fact, that these are very uh, productive accumulations of ice. And we've done glacial flow modeling, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner there, uh, to verify end-to-end -end that this is the process that's going on. So we're pretty confident about that. Next, please. We also have a lot of terrestrial experience with, in fact, um, the uh, distribution of these same types of features, debris-covered glaciers, in a cold and icy environment like Mars, in the, uh, the uh, Antarctic Dry Valley. So we've had five field seasons there where we investigated these things. You can see pictures of them in this slide. And also in the upper right-hand corner, we actually excavate down through the till and sample the buried ice for all the scientific treasures that that uh, has, including characteristics of previous climate uh, trapped in the bubbles, atmospheric bubbles in the ice. Next, please. So we looked at the most optimal one um, in terms of our, our selection across there. You'll see in the red band at the top, 14 different areas we've studied in detail, and we picked out the Deuteronilus Mincy one as a best example. Uh, you can see a large crater there, uh, that uh, a Noachian age crater at the dichotomy boundary, which in fact has these low bay debris aprons in the north and the south at area two and five, and those are examples of those. In the middle lower part, you can see a beautiful lobe coming through the old peak ring of this crater, and it's really indicative of glacial ice flow. So we've explored these in detail and uh, tested the idea that there's buried ice there by having charade in two papers, one by Holt in 2007, Holt, Holt et al., Plout et al., we, we were able to show right over this area that, in fact, there's buried ice, hundreds and hundreds of meters of buried ice. So this is great. We're really confident it's what's going on, and we're taking advantage of the assets in orbit right now, including Sherrod, uh, to examine these features in detail. Next, please. So if we take a look, uh, that's that should be the Sherrod data. So go on to the next one, please. Um, we're also taking a look at the characteristics of, that's the one, thank you. Uh, so we're looking at the uh, exploration zone, which has indeed a series of six uh, subzones, areas of interest, uh, regions of interest, and we've been examining these in detail. And so that's what uh, we want to talk about today. Uh, Aideen Denton here at Brown has been looking at the, the stratigraphy of these. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you can see from this that, um, from the stratigraphy here, next, yep, that's it. Um, you can see from the stratigraphy here that we actually have a significant amount of the geological history. A key point here is that this site addresses all of the fundamental questions outlined in DPAG documents. Next, please. Not only that, um, we, we can have uh, evidence for, in fact, the race, recent area, the Amazonian period, in which we see uh, a lot of evidence for uh, these debris-covered glaciers and also for more recent uh, latitude-dependent mantle, and Erica Jowan is studying paraglaciation, the analysis of what happens when the glaciers uh, stop forming so that we can now understand what's going on on the surface 
uh, from getting down and having access to these deposits. Next, please. So this leads to, um, in fact, these two exploration zones here, um, which uh, we're looking at in detail because these are the low bay debris aprons which have water resources at shallow depth. We know this from the Shira data, et cetera. So the question is, um, how do we get at that? Next, please. So what we're doing here is studying, um, in fact, the characteristics of these different zones here. And we're looking at two stages. One of them is the layered materials you can see on the left, uh, in which it looks like that's the most recent latitude dependent mantle. And then in the central part, the low bay debris aprons in which the uh, ice is hundreds and hundreds of meters thick. So hey, we're doing- Jeff, Yep. We have a couple questions for you, if I don't, don't mean to interrupt it, but we want to try nope. to make it more of a conversation. So Mackenzie Day is- Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so you've looking at this ice for being able to use. Do you? What evidence do you have in terms of how deep it is? We we know there's a zero to ten meter sort of noise region, if you will, with the, the with the frequencies of the radars we've used. But have you all been able to do anything to nail that down a little bit more? Yes. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we're doing in this analysis, which I'll just talk about in a couple of minutes here. The the Sherrod radar is ten to fifteen meters, uh, essentially the vertical resolution, if you will. Um, to detect that. So that's, uh, you know, in fact, we could say it's it's a little bit more than that, um, potentially, and we're looking at variations across the area to pick the sweet spots for uh, the excavation. And okay, we have, another, we have another question, but I think you're probably going to get to this, which talks about, or maybe allude to it a little later on, in, in terms of, I know you all looked at the site extensively, and the question is really poking at how you would use humans to explore the site. Um, vice robots and I know it's a little off what we're trying to do but that it's an intriguing question and given how much particularly given how much I've studied it absolutely and uh, one of the key recommendations we make is that there's a series of robotic measurements that need to be made before humans get there um, and so we're going to outline those in the last slide as well right thanks okay let's uh, let's press on and let's see if you can go to the next slide please uh, which is indeed the team that's working. Uh, at the present time. Um, in fact, we've added uh, uh, David Baker, who is doing a lot of work. David got his PhD here looking at the latitude dependent mantle and the debris cover in the um, uh, uh, lineated valley fill and low bay debris aprons. Uh, and a number of students here as well uh, who've been working on this. And so let me press on to talk about the details here in the next slide. We've picked four basic areas here, habitat design, synthetic biology, paraglaciation, and water in situ resource utilization. And the first one is uh, we've engaged two people, uh, in fact, Mark Nelson and Bill Dempster. Uh, Mark spent two years in the biosphere too, and uh, I have to say that you should read his book, uh, which is illustrated there, Pushing Our Limits, because in terms of what it's like to live for two years, this gets to the crew aspect, and also how to cite these things, which Bill Dempster was really important in in designing it. We've learned a huge amount from them. I don't want to dwell on that today, but I would just say these people are great resources for this, and we're learning a lot about where to put things and where to go within the uh, confines of this large crater, et cetera, from that point of view. Next, please. If we, we're also taking a look at synthetic biology. Uh, one of the key points about uh, human exploration of Mars is the upmass constraints. You don't want to take any more than you have to, uh, and how you can optimize human robotic partnerships here. So we've been looking at things like uh, 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 essentially synthetic biology to utilize uh, that capability to take, uh, to take soil from the surface of Mars and make bio bricks. So you don't have to carry the bricks there. You basically make them in situ with just a little bit of synthetic biology all the way up to microtexture through biodegradable UAVs we've studied, bioprinting, et cetera. Lynn Rothschild at NASA AIM is a key person here. And the teams are from Brown and Stanford. And the bottom line is that, next slide please, you can take a look. In fact, we're studying now microtexture where you can actually take material materials to the surface that can actually help to build habitats, et cetera. It's a little off the topic here, but the point is it's one of our major themes. So getting back to where the ice is, next please, uh, you can actually see evidence um, for uh, uh, the characteristics of these deposits on the surface. And this gets to the point about what happens and how we get access to the ice and how deep it is. So one of the things that happens after the glaciation is that a lot of the ice goes away and it's protected by a sublimation lag. So uh, Erica Jawan has been looking at paraglaciation, which is the characteristics of the processes that operate and the duration of what happens after the glaciation essentially stops. Ice accumulation stops, and so you begin to get 
uh, as out of an ice age and, and what happens during those times. So Erica has a couple of papers on this. We're looking at the global distribution of these deposits and uh, their characteristics, and this will enhance our ability to find multiple areas with this buried ice and optimize the return from uh, the sampling. Next, please. Um, the, the next thing we're able to do is to ask the question, we know there's buried ice, and this gets to an earlier question, but do we, you know, do we need to know, uh, what we do need to know is, is how to mine it. So uh, how do we go about that? The next slide illustrates this with the key questions. What do we need to know? We need to know the depth of the ice, the sediment cover, the nature and structure of the sediment cover. How do these vary in space? Is the sediment cover a useful construction thing? You don't want to just dig the stuff up and put it in a pile. You want to be able to use it, like with bio bricks and other things like that. And what are the difficulties in accessing the ice? Next, please. So we've been able to use a variety of data. Um, in fact, not just the high-rise images, which are incredible, but CTX, Sherrod, um, HRSC, stereo, et cetera, and looking at all these different aspects. So we've employed all these different things uh, to, in fact, get at these fundamental questions. So again, the assets that are in orbit right now, both US and ESA, uh, and the assets that will come in the future, which we'll talk about momentarily, are really critically important. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, this, is, this is an illustration of the kind of things we're finding, and in, there's a series of abstracts and a couple of papers coming out here by David Baker and Lynn Carter, uh, which illustrate the aerial distribution of the buried ice. So now we know there's buried ice all over the place in these things quite confidently, and so this enlarges our area uh, that we can go, and so what we need to know is what are the sweet spots in this area in Deuteronomus, but also in adjacent areas. And so <clears throat> David has found that uh, a number of pieces of evidence for a mantling unit on top of some of the ice in various different places. And that's really uh, excellent too because um, that's what's protecting the ice, but we don't want to make it any more hard to actually get at it. So the mapping the location of this buried ice, uh, this cover, the mantling units, is critically important and David is very hard at work in doing that. Next slides, please. And a key point here, and this gets to your earlier point, Rick, is how do we actually know how thick the ice is? And in a paper shown in the lower left-hand corner, uh, we use superposed crater morphology and morphometry as clues to substrate characteristics. So in a paper that Ailish Crest and I wrote some years ago, um, we actually were able to look at simple craters and these unusual ring mole craters to try to get at estimating the thickness. And so that was an ish, initial attempt. And David Baker and, uh, and colleagues has, since that time, as you can see, seen a lot more complex craters shown in the vertical panels, and these give uh, rise to the idea that the uh, sublimation layering on top is maybe from a multiple set of events. So the exciting thing here is that the uh, work that David has been doing has uh, been able to help us show regional variations in this cover. Not only that, it looks like some of these layers actually have ice in them. So the Shira data is helping us understand where that ice is and what we need to go through to get to the pure ice uh, uh, below that at depths of probably 15 to 30 meters uh, deep. And again, the characteristics of that ice in order to, uh, characteristics of that sublimation lag in order to see what we can utilize, in fact, for making bio bricks or rocks, for example, for making protection, protective cover, et cetera. So all of these things have been really great. And this is in the probe, um, the, 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 this is the work that we're doing at the present time uh, to in fact analyze, as you can see in the middle diagram, these multiple layers see where we have one layer, see where the thinnest deposits are, and then optimize uh, refining our um, exploration zone to uh, find the, the sweet spot in that as well. So if we could go to the last slide here, um, uh, in fact, when we take a look at all this together then, <clears throat> we wanted to, as we were instructed in the initial meeting, gather data from specific Mars surface sites and then take a look at what we can get from continuing uh, spacecraft. Well, clearly MRO, and ESA Mars Express are really, really important assets. We've been utilizing those in this study extensively. And for future spacecraft, um, ESA Trace Gas Orbiter is going to give us important information. ExoMars and China and NASA's 2020 uh, rovers and orbiters will be, of course, really critical. The kinds of things we need with orbital assets have to do with um, shallow ground penetrating radar, uh, thermal inertia measurements, again, very high resolution altimetry and spectroscopy are also going to be useful. And then the rover assets, much of this will be on the 2020 missions, um, ground penetrating radar, uh, subsurface water detectors, 
microscale surface topography so we can do actually modeling of this as well as, as uh, sighting aspects. Uh, soil mechanics experiments, mobile weather stations are critically important and very high resolution spectroscopy. And again, the final point we're making here is that we're developing a white paper which outlines the strategic knowledge gaps to, uh, to get at these issues. And the last absolute last slide um, is the next one. Thanks very much. So, so, Jim, a couple uh, questions coming in. Uh, well, first of all, um, I know that SpaceX looked at Ural's general area pretty heavily for when they were trying to send a red dragon, and mm -hmm. it was generally an assessment that the terrain was too rough for landing. Can you talk a little bit to that? And then a second question has come in to it, and we really appreciate all the questions, everybody. The second question is, you know, once humans are there, you've thought a lot about this in general. You know, can you talk about how you're going to still get science done when you get human beings there with all the uh, microbial loadings and all those other things that they bring with them? Um, just a few words on that, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I think, um, so, you know, the first order question is, uh, you know, the first astronaut that lands on the surface of Mars is a Noah's Ark of Earth microbes. There's absolutely no question about that. So, you know, we need to keep that in mind. I think the key point here would be uh, that we want to be like we do when we go to Antarctica. When we drill these cores of ancient ice, we're very careful with the protection, et cetera, and we want to go to the interior of the ice. So I think the geological record of uh, ancient climates that we will derive from uh, this can be very well taken care of in terms of the same protocols we use in Antarctica. Um, on the other hand, I think that um, the, uh, to go back to your other question of uh, the sighting and SpaceX, so SpaceX, uh, I, is my understanding, would like to get to a flat area, which they can get ice uh, very rapidly and quickly. Um, and the goal of the workshop was not so much just for that, uh, a, a worthy goal in of itself, but it was to, in fact, uh, optimize the science and the human exploration aspects. And so this site optimizes the science and engineering aspects. If I were going to send the first mission to the surface of Mars and not take any water with me, I would definitely go to a very flat area, uh, uh, it, it, one that had buried ice at a shallower level, okay. But when you're optimizing, and that might be what SpaceX would, would in fact choose, okay. But here we had different instructions, which I hope are the same instructions that uh, we'll utilize for humans going to Mars. Um, and, uh, and like we did in Apollo, optimize the science and the engineering. And this site is uh, an attempt to do that. Both of them are absolutely worthy uh, goals, and I would hope we would uh, actually do both. Okay, and then uh, two other questions, and we'll get moving on to the next one. Uh, so from Andrew, what addition, what's your priority in terms of additional orbital assets that should be in place before uh, we sent attempt to send humans, and then from Laurent at KSC, can you clarify the link between observation of dry glacial beds filled with debris and the location of buried ice? Is the remnant ice below these glacial beds? So two questions for you. Yes, let me take the second one uh, first. So the so what we see in Antarctica is there they are coal based glaciers as they would be on Mars. So that means that the uh, that the actual ice is uh, essentially welded to the substrate. So they don't operate like mid latitude glaciers, which like the ones we have here in New England or have had in the past. Um, and so most of the debris comes from uh, rockfall on top of the ice. And so once you, the, 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 what's protecting the ice from subliming away is in fact that rock and soil material on the top. So we have to penetrate through that to get to the really relatively pure ice. Uh, so that's the challenge uh, to get through that. And, and we're learning a lot more with Sherrod and these other techniques as I pointed out uh, to, uh, you know, about what that's about. And, and in fact, finding that it's a resource potentially for water uh, as well. There may be buried ice layers within those layers that are covering the pure ice. And the second question was, what was my, um, I, you know, from orbital assets, um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, high resolution spectroscopy is utilized is good, but, you know, this, some of these areas are somewhat dusty. Uh, I think very high resolution altimetry, we get a lot with uh, stereo photogrammetry, but uh, that's a useful one. And the absolute uh, top one would be if, if it is possible to design a uh, shallow radar instrument that really refined uh, the uh, assessment of the layering and the upper few meters, that would be, in fact, really, really great. Uh, the ground penetrating radar for the, for the lander um, is uh, on 2020, uh, and, and uh, I think both on the Chinese and the U.S. mission, and so uh, that, that's, that hopefully will be extremely useful as well. Over. Okay, thanks, Jim, and uh, 
Bob. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And uh, I think up next we've got John. Over to you, John. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, as Bob said in the introduction, my name is Jonathan Hill. I'm a FEMIS mission planner at Arizona State University. And today I'm going to talk uh, and summarize uh, the additional analysis we've done on the Western Noaccus Terra Chloride Deposit Exploration Zone since the uh, 2015 workshop, which has been heavily influenced by the data we requested through the HLS2 MRO data request program. Uh, so next slide. So just to summarize uh, the analysis we've done, we've identified a traversable approach to the chloride deposits, which are the primary science ROI uh, for this exploration zone. The acquired data we have further supports the presence of water ice rich pasted terrain uh, in one of the craters. Unfortunately, we've also disproved the presence of lineated valley fill uh, in a small channel that we were uh, kind of counting on to be one of our primary resource ROIs. And as a result of all this, we've moved the center of our EZ to be closer to uh, likely subsurface water ice deposits uh, and further away from our primary science goal. So next slide. Um, so just to orient ourselves, this is where the um, Noaccus Terra Chloride deposits are located on the planet. Uh, in the southern highlands and the mid-latitudes. Next slide. And on this slide, you can see a close-up view of the exploration zone. This is colorized topography over Themis DIR uh, imagery. And you can see the exploration zone is generally centered on the dark uh, igneous unit uh, near the center. And on top of that unit is where we find the chloride deposits. Uh, to the north is a small outflow channel, and to the south are a number of smaller uh, olivine-rich volcanic deposits, which may also have chloride deposits uh, on top of them. Next slide. So here's a quick look at the different science and resource ROIs that we identified uh, in our initial study, and the MRO data request that we made focused on the highest priority science and resource ROIs. And so the first site we're going to look at is Science ROI 1, uh, which is the chloride deposits themselves. So next slide. So the main goal uh, of going to these chloride deposits is that they indicate a potentially past habitable environment where you would have had uh, copious liquid water and then the chloride deposits themselves have a very high preservation potential uh, due to fluid inclusions that get trapped within the uh, chloride minerals. And also they're sitting on top, in this case, uh, on top of a volcanic unit that also provide us uh, with a datable surface. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see the results of the high-rise imaging that we requested. And uh, looking what in the CTX image on the left looks like relatively flat terrain, you can see on the right, the chloride deposits are actually extremely rough terrain here. Um, that is not terrain that would be easily navigable by a pressurized rover and probably wouldn't be something that uh, a human in a spacesuit could traverse very far on. And so uh, looking through the MRO, uh, we determined uh, that the easiest way to sample these chloride deposits, if you go to the next slide, would be to approach them from the south-southwest. And this sort of offers the best, although not optimal, uh, approach to the deposits. You can see that the approach there is still uh, a little difficult terrain, um, but it looks like it would be navigable given some time, uh, possibly with a pressurized rover. And then the idea would be that a human would then traverse a short distance into the chloride deposit, sample the material, uh, and then traverse back out. So if you go to the next slide, um, the summary of our conclusions, like I said, the chloride deposits itself is a little too rough to navigate. Um, so ideally you would approach them from that south southwest uh, corner to try to uh, make your traverse as easy as possible. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, this is a reminder of where our resource ROIs are located and the high-rise imagery we requested here focused on 
uh, resource ROIs one and two, which we were considering our main uh, water ice uh, resources. Uh, next slide. So resource ROI one, uh, you can see here is pasted terrain on the pole facing slope of this crater. And uh, previous analysis has shown that these are likely caused uh, by subsurface water ice that, as I said, persisted on the pole facing slope. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the imagery we received, uh, which shows a detailed view of gullies carving through this pasted terrain. And if you go to the next slide. Uh, uh, real quick on that one, John. Um, yes. Are those gullies, are they the same thing as the recurring slope lineae that we hear so much about? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, these gullies uh, in this image here, here are not. Uh, although on the other side of this crater, um, there are some potential uh, RSLs. Uh, they haven't been confirmed because we just don't have enough uh, high-rise imagery over them to see the, the recurring nature of them. Um, but yeah, so this crater would contain both gullies and RSLs. Thank you. Um, so in this location here, though, uh, on the western rim, the gullies have formed uh, but as you start getting more and more pole facing on the slope, they suddenly cut off. And so we think this is consistent with a, a ice deposit, subsurface ice deposit, with a relatively thin uh, debris or lag deposit on top of it. And so on the not so poleward facing slopes, over time that has been able to melt and carve gullies. But on the pole facing slope, hopefully that uh, subsurface water ice is more intact. And this is by no means conclusive, and so we are going to need additional analysis, probably with uh, Shara data, to look at uh, these pasted terrains and uh, strengthen this hypothesis. And if you go to the next side, uh, we'll look at our second resource ROI, what we were hoping would be lineated valley fill, uh, providing us more accessible subsurface water ice deposits, because you can see uh, this sort of discontinuous but sinuous channel uh, in the debris of that same, uh, ejected debris of that same crater. Uh, if you look very closely at the CTX images, there appear to be sort of lineated features along those channels, and that's why we thought it could be lineated valley fill. But if you go to the next slide, uh, and then the next slide after that, you can see when you zoom really far in on these high-rise images, uh, suddenly that those lineated features start looking much more like layering in the ejecta deposit uh, rather than lineated valley fill. And hey, so John, if you go to the next slide. John, yes. uh, so let me go, if we, and maybe if we can go back to the slide about our region of interest or ROI1, um, Laurent uh, has a question that is, what are the estimated altitude differences between the peaks and valleys seen in high rise in a science ROI1? Do you have a sense of, can you characterize that offhand or do you, would you have to think about it? Um, yeah, offhand, uh, I believe it was uh, a little under a kilometer from the base of that. Uh, if you go to uh, Bob or Brad, if you go th a couple slides forward. So at the bottom of that crater, there is some concentric crater fill. Uh, you can see. Oh, yeah, forward one more. Yeah, that one. Uh, so at the bottom of the crater there, uh, between the crater rim and the peak in the center, you can see that there's some uh, slightly jumbled terrain. Uh, so the vertical distance between that and the top of the crater rim is about a, a little less than a kilometer. I'd have to refresh myself on the exact measurement. And so that's one of the downsides of this resource ROI is that uh, some of those slopes are a little sharp. And so okay. accessing some of that subsurface water ice could be challenging. Great, thank you. Great. Okay, Brad, uh, if we could move forward a couple slides. There we go. Uh, so again, uh, oh, sorry, back one. So again, if we look at those uh, sort of linear features within that channel, they start looking uh, much more like layering uh, in the walls of the channel, which would be layering in that crater's uh, ejected deposit. And so uh, this 
particular uh, region will no longer be considered as a resource ROI uh, in our analysis moving forward. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So after taking all this uh, new analysis into account and after seeing the uh, results of the workshop and the results of some of the discussions we've had on these Google Hangouts, we've decided to move the original landing site, uh, which is shown here in green, and move it to a new location, which is outlined in blue, and sort of recenter the exploration zone around that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see the advantage of uh, moving to this new uh, landing site is that you basically recenter the exploration zone instead on uh, likely subsurface water ice deposits. Our initial goal was to center the EZ on the best science deposit, but as we've seen, the importance of subsurface water ice is, is going to be critical to this mission. And so we want to move our uh, landing site closer to that and then have our primary science goal be a drive to location. And so this crater here, uh, which was the target of our third high-rise image, has some potentially uh, viscous crater fill, not quite concentric crater fill, but still looks, uh, has viscous features to it. And the western rim seems to be the only promising accessibility uh, point to that material. So if hey, you go uh, to the next hey, slide. Don, Don. Yes. All right, another question. You mentioned uh, overburden covering the water ice. Can you talk a little bit about how well that is characterized? Uh, John, you're muted. OK, Rick, uh, I, I barely heard your question. Was it uh, the quality of the water ice that you were yeah, asking about? Characterize the overburden. And do you, are you all able to do any of that with what you've studied so far? Uh, yeah, so um, if you actually go to the next slide, you can see that um, unlike some of the slides that uh, uh, Jim was showing, the high-rise image we got here uh, was not particularly sharp. And so uh, the craters into this deposit of uh, a potentially viscous crater fill material uh, weren't really clear enough to try to analyze that overburden. And so uh, if we have the chance to request additional imagery, we might request a follow-up image in the same location, hopefully get a, a clearer view um, of the surface and be able to do some sort of analysis like that. OK, thanks. Um, so the, the point of this uh, image on the right, this high-rise image, is uh, this terrain looks very navigable, very traversable. And so it would be relatively easy to move from the flat landing site a uh, short distance to where this uh, potential viscous crater fill material is located. Uh, if you go to the next slide, this is a view uh, right where the rim meets that material. And you can see there are some relatively fine layering in that material. Uh, but like I said, due to the sort of fuzziness uh, in this image, it's a little hard to uh, use this to analyze what the potential overburden uh, might be. And so that's where we're hoping additional data in the future uh, might be able to help us clarify that. If you go to the next slide. So uh, the conclusion from this is that the slope uh, from the northwest appears to be smooth enough that it would be traversable uh, to get to that vis vis viscous crater fill material, uh, although more analysis, uh, such as radar data, is going to be needed to strengthen the hypothesis that this uh, apparently viscous material is, in fact, subsurface surface water ice. And if you go to the final slide, uh, this is what our next steps are going to be. Um, we've done some very initial sh uh, charade analysis, and it has not shown uh, an obvious subsurface reflector in that crater fill material. And so unlike the low-grade debris aprons that Jim was talking about, um, we, don't, we don't see a clear boundary between uh, the potential icy material and the underlying terrain. And so that could mean that uh, this water ice material is dirty and there's not a, a clear con uh, change in material properties. So we're not seeing a sharp contrast. Um, but 
assistance with processing Sherrod and Marshall's data would be very helpful. So that's something we'd propose that the HLS2 community might uh, develop some way of helping people with. And second, we want to start looking at realistic traverse routes to all of the science and resource ROIs, not just the primary ones. And so uh, having CTX DTMs available in these areas would greatly uh, assist in that effort as well. And with that, I will turn it back to Bob. Uh, all right. two, two questions real fast. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all is, can you characterize the uh, 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 paucity or, or lack thereof or a sufficient uh, amount there is? You're in a, a mid-latitude location of data and we've normally focused in the equatorial regions and you, can you talk to that? And then secondly, can you talk to dust a little bit in this area in the southern hemisphere and what you all have learned about that as well? Uh, okay, so I'll start with the, the second question um, about dust. Um, the Southern Highlands can be a little dusty uh, in locations. Um, however, uh, if you go, to, it might be too far for Brad to scroll through, but if you go to the early slides, you can see that the dust is thin enough that uh, in most areas we can get good themis spectroscopy uh, and differentiate between different uh, geologic units. And so we don't think the dust in this particular location uh, is too much of a problem. Um, can you remind me what the first question was? Yes, the question is an overall assessment of the amount of data that you have to work with for this exploration zone, since it's in the mid latitudes where we have normally focused uh, data for robotic missions in the more equatorial locations, because that's where we're landing usually. Right, so the data availability in this region isn't isn't terrible, but it's not great either. Um, one of the unfortunate things is that uh, until the um, initial survey of chloride deposits was done uh, by Australu et al., this area was really unremarkable. And so it hasn't been the target of a lot of study and therefore the target of a lot of data collection. And so uh, luckily we do now have high rise images um, there are some charade tracks that cross through here just uh, by chance. Um, but if there, as I was saying, if there was a, an opportunity to arrange a follow-up MRO data request, I think that would be uh, very helpful, particularly for this exploration zone. Okay, and one uh, last one. Um, from Laurent uh, is uh, can you, is the thermal inertia data available that could uh, help getting an idea of the surface roughness in the uh, regions of interest areas? Would it help or not provide sufficient resolution? Um, I, the thermal inertia data is available, um, and I think combining that uh, with the high rise data that we do have of certain locations. Uh, can really inform us about the rockiness of it. Um, however, uh, the chloride deposit terrain that I showed, it wasn't really rocky, it was just rough. And so that might not be fully captured in the uh, thermal inertia data, but I'd have to look closer at that. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, next up is Don. Hi, uh, Don Barker here. Um, uh, glad to be with you guys. This is interesting and fun always, as usual, especially since I do this on the side all, uh, all the time. Um, I'm a, a flight controller, uh, systems engineer, and crew trainer at JSC for the past 24 years on the space station program, and a newly minted PhD in geology. So hopefully I can bring all that information to bear on this topic. And if you want to go to the first slide, jump right in. Or probably second slide. <laughs> Not cover yet. Uh, basically, for this, uh, since we were given this opportunity to get uh, uh, imagery uh, from the last uh, meeting, um, we've gone in and reviewed uh, uh, what we got, and it, it's interesting, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Um, so, uh, the first thing is to review the imagery that we got. Um, we found some potential for some uh, permafrost uh, locations, uh, indicators of, of permafrost locations that might uh, be helpful in, in hunting for ice. Um, and uh, lastly, we're, we're, the, the reason this site was chosen initially is, is I keep trying to uh, focus in, um, as opposed to what Jim was saying, I didn't optimize for science and resources, I optimized for resources and, and 
took the old adage that if you build it, they will come. And if we're there, we'll eventually get all the science we want. But we got to get there first. Um, so the last one is uh, going to kind of hit in on some of the stuff that we need to get to nail down our data. Uh, the image on the right shows the uh, the, the uh, easy uh, exploration zone area with the three um, uh, image areas that we got from uh, high rise. Um, it's interesting to note, and you'll, you'll kind of see how this goes through here, uh, the amount of imagery that any individual site might have is, is depending on who's been studying that area. You can see the red areas on this uh, image are the only high-rise images in this area besides the three that was added from this, this study. And uh, so part of the, the interesting problem of, of determining human landing sites is narrowing down the, the, the bandwidth and getting high-resolution data for these areas. Next slide. Ready for next one, sorry. <laughs> And this just shows the map that uh, we saw earlier. Uh, the Flegre Dorse area is on the top right, on the uh, uh, eastern side of the, the Flegre Dorse ridges or, or mountains. Next slide. And this just shows another uh, context image uh, with the Themis image uh, showing the, the exploration zone, proposed landing ellipse area. Uh, we're at a very low altitude, uh, purposely chosen um, for uh, assist for entry, descent, landing architecture for uh, larger vehicles, uh, enhanced radiation protection, uh, atmospheric mining potential, uh, atmospheric uh, wind energy source potential. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can add in um, that you don't always think about when you're choosing one of these sites. Next slide. This is the original. Slide from the uh, uh, 2015 uh, presentation that we gave. Um, everything is the same so far, uh, except for the small uh, science ROI five uh, circles that uh, we were able to uh, dig into a little bit more. And that was the, the I'll show you some more information on that regarding the uh, potential for more uh, 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 interesting finds that, that we still don't know exactly how to quantify. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, and I kind of just talked this one. So this is the same thing I just said with the, with the overview. So next slide. So basically we got uh, three images, uh, imagery places, and I uh, basically label them east, uh, north, and uh, west. Um, uh, given their relative position basically to the, the center of the, the landing list. Um, the east imagery site, um, this is a context image. Um, this uh, uh, is the high, higher resolution one, so we'll go to the next slide and you'll see the, the high rise imagery. Um, it's interesting to uh, see that there's some uh, very uh, coarse grained, variegated type uh, surfaces that probably have been desiccated to a certain extent because of uh, probable subsurface ice deposits, um, hopefully, um, which may be just a lead into uh, uh, more resource availability. Next slide, so the uh, Western one, I think you got that one up already. Um, this one's kind of interesting. There's a, a couple of papers out there from a, a while ago, uh, uh, basically labeling the domes and mounted uh, sections in this area as, as, uh, uh, as interesting points of potential uh, Possible geothermal or gas uh, eruptions, um, but that's uh, still lots, lots to be done. We, we still don't know exactly what causes those, uh, but potentially, uh, and I think I need you to go back to one slide. There we go. Uh, just for the domes, uh, the, the uh, debris aprons that surround those. Um, could be uh, potential sources uh, for other uh, other uh, locations for uh, ice deposits just because of the fine grained nature of that material. Like Jim said, that is how ice gets sequestered in the subsurface because uh, the porosity in the space doesn't allow sublimation to get to, to lose that ice, basically. 
Next slide. Next slide. There you go. Um, just a close up on the, the, the high rise image. Uh, as you see, it, it produces very narrow, high resolution uh, image slides. And when you start uh, digging into those, you can spend hours just mapping along the trajectory and, and seeing what the, the, the surface is. Uh, the first one was some, there's some very interesting, uh, what looks like either craters or, or pits of some sort that have these plateaued Paris uh, type uh, monument hills in the middle of them. I don't think, I, I haven't found anything in the literature that supports uh, what they are exactly, um, but that was interesting. Uh, the middle one shows some possibly polygonal uh, uh, permafrost type terrain um, that uh, uh, is uh, ubiquitous in the area. And the last one shows uh, another area, uh, area of, of basically rock strewn uh, regolith, um, which we need to characterize better to find out some of the uh, rock sizes and the distributions for uh, safe landing. Next slide. And the north uh, site, just north of the landing zone. Uh, several of these sites contain lots of the same uh, features in this area because it's relatively very flat, um, but there's a lot of uh, paraglacial or, or, or uh, potential ice bearing uh, formations, such as the crater that's in here uh, with the uh, lobate uh, crater deposits that kind of surround it. So, again, potential source of water. Um, and interesting northern uh, latitude uh, geological process when you get impact craters. Next slide. And kind of the same thing again. Uh, the rocky terrain is, is all over the place, as we saw on the first one on the, on the eastern side. Um, around some of these uh, uh, mounds, you get this interesting uh, semi scalloped uh, uh, terrain that, that could be indicative of ice deposits um, just because of how it, it looks like it's formed, but that, that's still uh, to, be, to be determined. Next slide. So like I said, uh, for me, the, the most important thing is water for uh, determining a human landing site. And our, probably our best instrument to date is the gamma ray spectrometer on uh, Mars Odyssey. And, but the problem is, uh, like the first uh, slide, uh, very little high resolution data is yet known um, for, for most of the planet. Um, for, for this instrument, uh, 270 kilometer radius uh, uh, footprint uh, basically is almost like throwing a dart in a big uh, uh, <laughs> patch of ground and trying to say, I know exactly what's in it. So uh, we'll see, I'll show you some of the information on how we need to narrow down that information too. Next slide. Uh, we just saw this earlier, and I just added this as a potential, uh, the, that number five science, science ROI. You can see the context image of these types of pits uh, uh, with uh, table-like mountains in it that have layering. Uh, very interesting, and they're scattered throughout the, the region. Next slide. And uh, this was just one kind of target of opportunity. I was looking at some old uh, CTX imagery. Um, and I got the dates and, and uh, years up there, and I believe I caught a dust devil in one of these. And the far right is an extreme zoom in on the high rise imagery for that that uh, area, uh, the exact center of that area. And there is no indication of of uh, that something moved through there. It's very interesting. Um, so I think there's not a lot of surface dust in this area. If you go to some of the context imagery that is north, uh, just north of this uh, exploration zone, so maybe 100 kilometers plus north, there are lots of ground tracks left uh, in either the dust or whatever the surface regolith is at that point that uh, seems to indicate a highly active uh, dust uh, devil environment, uh, wind environment. Uh, but down here, uh, just south of that, it kind of narrows down to almost nothing. And I think this is just an interesting catch at the time. Next slide. So kind of the conclusions here, um, I got a couple slides after this, uh, uh, but uh, the conclusions is, I, I think this is great that we keep uh, digging into Mars 
uh, well, not being yet new, uh, but into the data that we do have. And uh, but I think that the just surface imagery data um, is highly unlikely to allow us to narrow down landing sites. Um, even when you add in a lot of the other spectral or or other types of uh, remote sensing data, just because the size of the ground footprint on the data is so huge, um, and I'll get into a mining uh, analogy of why I think that, uh, but it just leaves we have a lot more left to do on this. Um, uh, and, and like I said, the, the reason I chose this site basically was resource first, science second, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, so the last part here is if you go to the next slide, a couple uh, months ago we had a meeting in uh, uh, University of uh, Colorado School of Mines um, on planetary and uh, all all space resource uh, mining and utilization. And I've been working on this uh, uh, figure for a couple years and it's based on a petroleum industry uh, resource management system that tells uh, allow is a guideline for them on how they will decide whether they will start drilling holes in the ground um, to access any given resource. I've tried to modify this and, and move it towards a planetary perspective, uh, moon, Mars, asteroid, et cetera, and it's probably uh, pretty good for all of them, but it still needs a lot of uh, tweaking and uh, um, definitely defining what the meaning are. On the right-hand side, I, I've gone from, for this one, from this uh, exercise, it allowed me to uh, base this on uh, meters per pixel resolution for these categories. So I, I, these are totally arbitrary numbers at this point, and they need to be nailed down. But if we want to get 95% proved uh, uh, information that we know the 95% what the volumes of resources in a given area are, that is, is a good enough indicator that we can mine that at that uh, uh, reliability level. Uh, we might need to get less than one meter per pixel uh, equivalent uh, remote sense type data so we can actually calculate those volumes and the actual locations. And then there's all sorts of other uh, definitions. Um, if you look up these, uh, 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 the, the planetary, uh, it used to be petroleum resource management system. So if you look up the definitions there, they're very close. And uh, uh, that's all I'll put on that for right now. So we'll go to the next slide. Now I won't go into each one of these, um, uh, but basically I've, I've covered them all in parts on every single slide before. Uh, it's, uh, homework for the for the reader. Um, but the most important thing I think, from my perspective, is that we need to understand the volumes of resources that are available um, for extraction, and that that uh, kind of takes us down the road of possibly redirecting our mentality of space. Uh, human space flight um, away from exploration and, and a little bit away from science and focus on understanding the resources that are available. By doing that directly, we will understand the science that's involved because they're going to be taking the same data, basically. But it's, it's kind of the process of looking as opposed to, um, it's just kind of the process of looking. So, and, and I keep hoping that uh, it'll be interesting to see where we're in 2020 from now. I don't know why I put March on there. But <laughs> we'll go. We'll, let's see. I think uh, in the last two slides are just backup slides for for everybody. That um, uh, a lot of uh, links and stuff like that. And I want to make a, a short call out that the, the, the resource I use for uh, my mapping is JMARS from ASU. Um, well familiar and good tool, that's continuously evolving. And, and uh, I think that's all I have right now. All right. Thank you, Don. Um, and unless we, Rick, do we have any questions from the audience? You want to try to get in in the last minute here? Yeah, let's try to do two real fast. So Laurent asks, um, uh, you mentioned permafrost uh, drains, Don. Is permafrost expected to have be, have persisted at the surface at these lower latitudes in the current pressure temperature conditions? And then I have a like, more mobile question for everybody else after that. Okay, copy that. I'll, I'll do this real quick. Um, this uh, actually, this site was not one of the lower latitudes. This is up towards the uh, uh, border of the, uh, the workshop uh, latitude range, 
Um, and, and like I said, from the gamma ray spectrometer data, which I think is probably the best data right now for indications of ice slash water, um, it only has a resolution, I think, of a few tens of centimeters at most. So that means it's very, very near the surface. Um, and that's one of the reasons I chose the higher, the higher latitude. It, it makes it a little bit harder thermally overall, but I think that outweighs some of the other things for the low latitude and stuff. So, but I think the potential for near surface extractable water is, is high in those areas. Okay, and one other question um, for maybe start with Jim on this one. Uh, this can, one uh, can what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on air, air, subsurface ice deposits? deposits. Uh, can you repeat that, Rick, please? And then I have a look. Then I have a look. Yeah, let me figure out why. It's, figure out why. It's. So we need everybody. So we need everybody to meet. Okay, I didn't copy the question. Sorry, over. Okay, so the question is really about we, you know, we're talking about trying to put humans near subsurface ice, and um, and but obviously, if you're landing there and you're taking off, you've got engines running and generating a lot of heat in there, and human operations in general generate a lot of heat. And so this is really kind of curious. Uh, one of the, we have a question here is poking at that reality that that is are somewhat potentially incongruous or that you have to manage it and get, like to get we'd, they, we'd like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, Jim, you're muted. So uh, it's a, it is indeed a management question. So uh, you know we're going to need heat to extract some of the ice, and in, indeed. Um, uh, and so the bottom line is, I mean, if you expose the ice, it's going to ablate. So you're going to have to have uh, you know condensation characteristics and, and engineering, et cetera, to take advantage of it. So I, I don't think it's a problem. The heat with landing uh, and associated aspects. I think maybe the permafrost. Uh, is one um, area that uh, you know uh, the per experience with terrestrial permafrost is uh, uh, is is probably the most relevant. Over. Okay, and okay, anyone and else? Anyone else have to add to that? It's gone, and I concur with that. Um, uh, there's lots of examples of problems building on permafrost uh, that we have today. Um, in my opinion, one of my other degrees is space architecture, and one of the things that I think we would be building first is uh, centered or some other concrete-based landing platform for future spacecraft. Um, so I think we can mitigate a lot of that just by designing the, the landing area in an appropriate manner. So I'll just throw in um, one of the things I particularly liked about uh, our Western Oaxaca's Terra Chloride Deposit EZ was that the subsurface water ice locations are relatively constrained, and so it is possible to choose landing sites or habitation sites that are close to them but off of them. And so you wouldn't be landing on subsurface water ice. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about long-term uh, deflation or, or altering the thermal balance that currently exists, and you know having that effect your landing site or your habitation area. If I could just add to that, it, it seems to me that it's a good possibility that the descent engine will actually help you to get to the ice. It's certainly not going to burn through it uh, in the short term. Over. Okay, and great, great point. Great point, everybody. Okay, and uh, that wraps up today's HLS2 Hangouts. We'd like to thank our presenters and thank you all for joining us. We encourage our HLS2 community to continue the conversation. So if you have any thoughts and ideas on what knowledge gaps we should address next, please contact us at nasa-mars-exploration-zones at mail.nasa.gov. And as always, please send any comments, feedback, or questions there as well. And you can always find more HLS2 resources, including these presentations, on our uh, on our website. Um, uh, Rick, Ben, any final words? Oh, I would just like to say, I mean, thank, thank the speakers, and also it's uh, it's really pleasing and um, sa satisfying to see the excellent work that's been done, but the data that's been acquired um, since we had our workshop. It's it's very very. Um, 
pretty positive. Rick, anything from you? Uh, just two things. Well, one to echo Ben's thanks. And then two, just to underscore, we put it out in our newsletters. We are working very hard to generate next generation water maps of uh, hydrated minerals as well as subsurface ice with a target of getting these out in the March timeframe to the community. So we're, and we're very excited about the potential of those maps uh, with what we're seeing right now. And then uh, secondly, this is the first time we have done these this kind of a hangout where we're getting people to share what they're learning as a result of these data requests. So if anyone has feedback for us, we strongly welcome it. And then lastly, I'll last squeeze in a third just to thank everybody who tied in today and joined. We need your ideas. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ben and Rick. And again, we thank you for joining us. And on behalf of NASA's Human Landing Site Study Steering Committee, see you next time. <laughs>